Happy Easter, everyone. I love how Amanda said it. The tomb is empty. He's risen. The angel said he is not here. And this is what we celebrate today together on Easter. Hey, in a few moments, I'm going to jump into the scriptures in Mark chapter 16. So if you want to navigate there in your Bible or in your device, go ahead and do that now. But before I jump in and read with us, I want to tell you about something that happened to me last year. So if you were a part of Northway, you would remember that during 2020, there was a, there was a season where our services, our worship experiences, they were only online. We would do one on Saturday night, and that's actually when we would film the online service experience. I would come in this one particular weekend. I was preaching, so I was here on Saturday. We filmed everything. It went out on Saturday night, and then Sunday morning, our services were at 9 and 11. They were online only. So this one particular Sunday during COVID, I think we were in the red in, in Pennsylvania, if you remember what that was like. You know, I, I was at home and we decided as a family, we're going to watch the nine o'clock online service on our back porch outside. It was a really, really nice day. And so we're out there for the worship and it was, it was an amazing worship set. I remember worshiping and then there was a little host moment and then the message was about to come on. And, you know, since I had given the message yesterday, I was already really familiar with what the guy was going to preach in just a few moments, right? And so I decided like, I need to go get something up front in, in our garage. As I mentioned, we were behind our house. And so I walked to the front of our house. And when I got near the driveway, I was going to get an extension cord, if I remember it correctly. When I got to the driveway, I heard a voice. Like this was like a beautiful day. So there were, there were birds chirping. There were cars going by. Some of our neighbors were out and about. But when I heard this voice, the voice was the only thing I could pay attention to. And I knew this voice. It was a very, very familiar voice. It was a voice that honed all of me in to only lock eyes right there. And as I paid attention to the voice, I noticed it was coming from someone's phone. You see, there was, there was a woman who was pushing a stroller. She had a dog with her. There was a child in the stroller and she was watching her device. And as I looked at the phone and I looked at her, she sort of did the same exact thing. She looked at the phone and she looked at me on my driveway and she looked down and she looked back up and she looked down and I knew all along what was going on. It took her just a few moments to realize it because I was really familiar with the voice. And finally, like the fourth time she looked up, she goes, I think I'm watching you right now. And I froze in that moment. Like I froze. I was locked into the voice. I knew it was my voice. We recognize our voice. We have moments where we recognize if someone says our name in a, in a crowded area, you hone in and you recognize that. Well, I froze because this was happening during church. And if anyone should have been in church at that moment, it should have been me, right? Like I should have been in church. So I felt like I was caught red handed on my driveway. She caught me and I'm thinking, is she going to scold me? Is she, she going to shame me? Is she going to like say something that I'm going to have to respond to and I'm going to be embarrassed and I'm going to be frustrated for like the next three days? Well, it turns out she was really, really gracious with me. She was like, hey, it's great to meet you. I live in this general area and I didn't know you lived here. And we had like a wonderful conversation and I was like sort of off the hook and relieved. But as I reflected on like that experience, as funny as it was, I went back and told my wife and we sort of laughed and, and had like a little chuckle. That there was something going on in that moment that caused me to recognize my voice and pay only attention to my voice or, or my name or my likeness. It turns out it's something called the cocktail party effect. Like think about it, if you're, at a, if you're at a party, maybe it's a cocktail party, right? And, and you're sort of gathered around, you could be in conversation, but if you hear your name from across the room, you will literally tune out all the other stimuluses around you and you will hone in on who said my name and what are they saying my name like? What emotion is sort of behind that? It's this amazing effect. Parents, this is why we call our kids sometimes with their full name, first, middle, and last, right? We want to command their attention. And something about that middle name causes kids to like snap too. And the, and the same is true for teachers as well. If you want to command your classroom, you will use first and last names and your students, no matter what they're doing, it will always draw their attention. The cocktail party effect. What's also interesting about this cocktail party effect is not only does our name or our likeness draw our full attention, but it also paralyzes us. And in a way, our next move after that moment is determined by the person using our name or the person watching the screen with our likeness on it. Their emotion and their reception and, and treatment of us in that moment shapes and determines how we will respond. 
You're familiar with this. You've experienced it. I said teachers use it. I said parents, we use it all the time. And what's interesting, when you look at the resurrection account of Jesus, God used it too. So here we go, Mark chapter 16. I wanna pick up with verse number one. And here's the scene that was going on before Mark writes this 16th chapter. Just three days ago, Jesus was crucified. He was killed on a cross. And his disciples, his closest friends, they scattered. And Peter, one of his closest of the closest, also denied knowing Jesus three specific times. They made him. They knew he was one of Jesus's boys, one of Jesus's his groupies, kind of his disciples, right? And they made him. And three times over and over and over again, Peter said, I don't know him. That wasn't me. And so here we are after Saturday, silent Saturday, we, we find Mark opening up chapter 16 with Easter Sunday. And here's what he writes. When the Sabbath was passed, that was Saturday, Mary Magdalene, Mary the mother of James and Salome, they bought spices so that they might go and anoint him. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. And when they were there, they were saying to one another, who will roll away the stone for us from the entrance of the tomb? So here it is, it's Sunday morning. And the women bought spices and they're talking about the stone because they expected to find a dead body. You don't bring spices to a tombstone if you don't expect to anoint an already dead corpse. Mark goes on. And looking up, they saw that the stone had been rolled back. It was very large. And entering the tomb, I give them a lot of credit in that moment. They went into the tomb. I'm not sure I would have done that, but they did. Entering the tomb, they saw a young man sitting on the right side, dressed in a white robe, and they were alarmed. And he said to them, do not be alarmed. You seek Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He has risen. He is not here. See the place where they laid him? You know, I love the, the messenger of the Lord, the angel in that moment. Like, think about it. This is really, really big news. This is like the most pivotal moment in all of history. And the message from the angel, don't you think it's rather short and sweet? It really, really is. It's because Jesus had been saying this all along. This wasn't like brand new news. This was actually a bit of a reminder. Like sometimes when I read this with that in mind, I feel like this is a bit of a, hey, I told you so. Right? And we don't like I told you so moments. They're, they're annoying and we don't like them because, gosh, I probably should have known that. I should have paid attention. And I think that's a little bit of what's going on here. It's a really short and sweet announcement that carries incredible weight. But Jesus had already been saying this. He predicted and told them that he would die and then rise again. So the angel says it really, really quick because he has other things to say. He goes on, he says, but go. Tell his disciples, referring to Jesus' disciples, and Peter, that he's going before you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. And they went out and fled from the tomb, for trembling and astonishment had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. You see, the angel of the Lord gives the women an assignment. And we know from, from other gospel accounts, we know that the women went back and they told the disciples and Peter. See, in all my years of reading the resurrection accounts that we find in Matthew and, and in like the, the gospel accounts of Jesus's life, I never noticed that Mark specifically has a call out for Peter. The angel said, go tell the disciples and Peter. See, what's interesting about Mark's gospel is we know Peter was Mark's primary source of information. And you got to know that scholars don't believe this was a quid pro quo moment. This wasn't like Peter asking for a little something in return. Hey, I'll tell you everything you want to know about Jesus, but you got to mention me a few times because I want to build my brand. Matter of fact, I might need to rebuild my brand after some of the things I said and did. No, that's not at all what's going on. This is something bigger. This is a restoration moment. This is the cocktail party effect in motion for Peter. Like, could you imagine him in that moment? Peter, we were supposed to tell all the disciples and we were specifically supposed to tell you. 
See, I think about Peter's state of mind and, and what was going on in his heart right there as he heard this news, as the women come back and they mentioned him by name. You gotta know that Peter in that moment, he wasn't doing real well. His emotional state of being, his mindset, it wasn't real healthy and like robust and filled with joy. Matter of fact, the opposite was true. If you think about it, Peter sorta felt like he was a living dead person. Like I think about his state of mind right there and you gotta think Peter was stuck in the past because he had just denied knowing Jesus. He had just done something that he said he wasn't gonna do, that Jesus predicted he would do and it was something that he would regret. It was something that no doubt created a sense of shame and guilt in his heart. It was something he wished he could go back and change and do over, but he couldn't. And when things like that happen, they tend to cause us to get stuck in our past. And that's where I think Peter was in that moment. Not only was, was Peter stuck in the past, but Peter had to be also full of fear. They just killed Jesus. Matter of fact, they just crucified Jesus. And they had already made Peter. They knew he was one of Jesus's boys. So if I'm Peter, you know what I'm thinking? I'm next. They're coming for me next. So I'm gonna hide. I'm gonna run. I'm gonna flee because this fear is paralyzing me. I'm on the run for my life. Look what they did to Jesus. They're gonna do it to me too. See, not only was Peter in that moment stuck in the past and and full of fear, but he also had to be really uncertain about his future. Like the movement, this thing he signed up for, this thing Peter gave his life to following Jesus, it, it felt over. Like you don't have a movement if you don't have a leader. And Jesus was dead. Jesus was nowhere to be found. The disciples sort of had scattered and Peter was on the run and he was afraid. And so it had to feel like my future, everything I was hopeful for was erased and dashed in this moment. And really at the end of the day, when I think about Peter's state, when he heard that news, he had to sort of feel like life really wasn't worth living. Like where would he ever find joy again? Where would he ever experience peace after these last three days? How would he ever be able to live with himself and move forward and move beyond these things that are seemingly wrecking him? See, but here's the good news. The resurrection, it changes everything. Because here's what we know about Peter. In that moment when he heard his name and and when the cocktail party effect took over, here's what we see happening with Peter. We know from the other gospel accounts. Remember, our next movement, our next response is based on the emotion of the person saying our name and he knew it was coming from God. And he knew God was a God of love and redemption and of restoration. And so what did Peter do? He ran to the tomb. He didn't run from the tomb. It's this beautiful moment of Peter feeling like he was dead, now starting to come alive because of the resurrection. And that's what the resurrection does. It brings dead things back to life. Peter ran to that tomb and he marveled at the empty tomb and the linen cloths lying there. And we know Peter made his way to the beach and saw Jesus and ran after him there. And on the beach over breakfast had a moment of restoration with Jesus, his teacher, who was alive. The resurrection changes everything. It did for Peter. It brought a dead man, seemingly dead man walking, back to life again. You know, I wonder sometimes if you and I, if we identify ourselves or our life with the Peter before he heard his name called. Do you ever feel like in in your life, you have a really uncertain future? You ever feel like after this this past year with COVID that everything that you had banked on or hoped in or were planning to have happen just got removed and eliminated? See, that's, that's what Peter was feeling in that moment, just this ridiculous amount of uncertainty. Do you ever feel fully terrified in this last year? You're not sure What's gonna happen next? You're not sure about your health. You're not sure about your employment. You're not sure about your kids' schooling. You're not sure about your finances. Do you identify with Peter in that way? I wonder sometimes if we, we too are like Peter where we are stuck in the past, where we did something that we regret. 
We said some words that we can't take back. We did some things that we know are sinful and they bring about this emotion of shame. And what they try to do is often anchor us in the past. And the idea of looking forward to a future, that's not even in the realm of possibility of us because if you only knew what we did or what I said or who I was, I imagine we're a lot like Peter many times in our lives. And I wonder if even so, sometimes we too wonder if life is worth living based on the worthlessness that we feel, based on how alone we feel, based on how unworthy we feel compared to everyone else, how unlovable, how insignificant. You know, if we identify with the Peter before he heard the news of the resurrection, then we can also identify with the Peter after learning about and experiencing the resurrection too. See, that's the good news of the gospel. That's who God is and what Jesus does. To me, I like to say it this way, the resurrection changes everything for everyone. This moment wasn't just for Peter. This resurrection reality where the resurrection changes everything and brings dead things to life, it wasn't just for Peter, it was for all of us. What's so amazing is when you look in the New Testament and when you see Peter, he risked his life so that we could hear a message from him. So we could learn that the resurrection was real and that it was true. And so we could understand just how life transforming it was, the fact that it literally did change everything. Later on in his life, Peter writes a letter. We know it as 1 Peter, and it was written to to the church, to Christians, to encourage them. And I want to read a few verses of what he wrote so we can understand what Peter was talking about, so we can hear just how confident he became, just how hope-filled he was, just how he really ultimately realized and woke up that, yes, life was worth living. Check it out and listen to his voice. He writes this, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us. See, the resurrection changes everything for everyone. That's why Peter uses the word us there. He's caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance, get this, that's imperishable, undefiled and unfading, kept in heaven for you who by God's power are being guarded through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you rejoice. Do you hear it in Peter's voice there? There's joy there, there's hope. Though now for a little while, if necessary, you've been grieved by various trials so that the tested genuineness of your faith more precious than gold that perishes, though it's tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Though you haven't seen him, you love him. Though you do not now see him, you believe in him and rejoice with joy that is inexpressible and filled with glory, obtaining the outcome of your faith, the salvation of your souls. The resurrection changes everything. And Peter is telling us in this moment that what the resurrection does is it helps us understand and be changed by making hope come alive. The resurrection changes everything for everyone by making hope come alive. You know what Peter's saying in that moment? He's saying, because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, because of the resurrection, all fear is gone. I'm a changed person. I am transformed. I am now alive again because I know he holds the future. And life is worth the living just because he lives. The resurrection changes everything for everyone by making hope come alive for all of us. It's pretty neat how Peter explains what this idea of a living hope means for you and for me if we are in Christ. Peter kind of tells us that right there in what he wrote, hope comes alive in this idea of a, of a great reversal in our hearts, right? We move from I am, I'm stuck in the past to now this new reality. I am no longer stuck in the past, but I can face tomorrow. 
It's a change. It's, it's coming alive again from once feeling like we were dead and we were stuck by the shame of our past. Peter said he caused us to be born again to a living hope. He's referring to salvation. He's referring to the finished work of Jesus' death on the cross and resurrection from the grave. Jesus forgives us of our sins because of his sacrifice on his cross and then victorious rising again from being dead. First John says it this way, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. The resurrection allows us to no longer be stuck, but to be free, but to come alive again and to face tomorrow with incredible joy because he lives. This is the transformative power of believing and receiving the resurrection. Not only does he talk about like, like the, the shame of our past and now being able to face tomorrow, hope comes alive, this living hope that Peter's talking about. He's telling us that, that I'm no longer full of fear, but rather all fear is gone. He said it this way, who by God's power are being guarded through faith. You know who has our back if we are in Christ? God. The one who defeated the thing that, that we fear the most, death. God was victorious over the worst possible outcome. If he can handle that and he has our back, what do we have to be afraid of? What really do we have to fear in the grand scheme of things? If God has our back, he's that powerful. Romans 8 says it this way. If the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who dwells in you. The same spirit that raised Jesus from the dead is alive and well in us. We don't have to fear because he lives. Peter goes on to explain this living hope and says it, I like to say it this way, I am no longer, I no longer have an uncertain future. I know he holds the future. Did you catch that part where Peter says that in heaven, an inheritance is being kept for us? It's imperishable. It's undefiled. It's unfading. It means it's not connected to the stock market. It's not connected to our personal ability to be holy or righteous or be perfect and never make a mistake or never mess up. It's not determined based on, on how our kids behave all the time. No, it's based on faith and it's preserved and saved and held for us in an imperishable, unfading place called heaven. It's a great inheritance. Romans 8 tells us that we are heirs with Jesus. We are heirs of God. We are sons and daughters of God. We have an inheritance that's kept for us. That means our future is secure when we are in Christ because he holds it. It doesn't go up and down based on the decisions of all the leaders of our world, like the stock market. It is set and secure because God holds it all. Here's the last thing that I believe Peter explains about what this living hope means and really how he helps us understand that the resurrection changes everything for everyone. No longer is life not worth living. I know that's a little bit of a double negative right there, but the other side is what's beautiful. Life is worth the living just because he lives. Peter tells us that we get to rejoice with a joy that's inexpressible. It's not connected to our circumstances. It's this confident, assured state of being because we know he lives. It's this joy deep down inside that guides all of our emotions and all of our decisions and all of our facing of tomorrows, no matter what comes. It's this joy that is determined for us based on Jesus's resurrection. It's this feeling that we know and believe and live like heaven. It's not a consolation prize. We live with this assuredness because heaven's a good place. It's a great place and we will one day be there because of the resurrection. It's this idea that we know and have this inexpressible joy because we will experience a reunion with all of our loved ones who have gone before us who were in Christ too. It's this beautiful picture of knowing the end of the story. We win. He's victorious. 
Sometimes if I miss a Steeler game or a, or a UNC basketball game, I record it on my DVR and, and I'm, I'm like, I love spoilers. I will go and see who won the game and then I will go and like watch the game again. And my favorite times are when my team has won and I'm watching the game. And the beautiful thing is I am at peace. I don't care how far down we are in the third quarter because I know the end of the game. I know the final score and the same is true in our lives as well. We win. Jesus is victorious. He rose again in the tomb is empty. And that gives us an inexpressible joy here and now on earth. The resurrection changes everything for everyone by introducing us to a living hope. But there's one extra thing about that that we've got to know. It changes everything for everyone who believes and receives. See, we play a part in this transformation. We play a part called faith, called trust in God. I think about it this way. This past year has been incredibly challenging. It's been unpredictable. It's been out of control. There have been variables upon variables causing us to make decision after decision after decision. And, and to be honest, many of us, we're just exhausted from, from all of the change and all of the, the lack of control. And when I look back at this last year, the way I think about it is, is that it's opened my eyes to see just how much I need the resurrection just how much I need transformation, just how much I need to believe in and trust something that is unchanging, changing. The saving power and grace of Jesus Christ through the resurrection. See, if we've learned anything in this last year, it's this fact that we don't have, always have the power to control, but we always have the power to surrender. And that's how we get to experience everything that Jesus is is giving to us through the the resurrection and that Peter is describing. This is how we can experience the truth of those lyrics we sang. Because he lives, I can face tomorrow. Because he lives, all fear is gone. Because I know who holds my future and life is worth the living just because he lives. See, to experience this transformation of the resurrection that is for all of us, that it, the fact that it brings dead things to life, it comes through faith in Jesus. And Romans 10 tells us very, very directly and simply that if we believe in our heart and confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord and God raised him from the dead, we will be saved. We will be in Christ we will become transformed like Peter. And we will literally be a new creation. You know, as many times as I've read that passage in Mark, this time something new jumped out to me. Maybe you're, you're tuned in right now and, and you've heard the Easter story. You've heard about the resurrection so, so many times before. Maybe this is your, your first time. Either way, if something has jumped out to you and you want to experience what Peter experienced, if you want to do what what Romans 10 tells us, confess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord, if you want to experience the life-transforming, new creation-delivering power of the resurrection, all it takes is a simple moment of confession with our mouth and belief in our heart. I want to give you a moment to do that right now. Would you close your eyes and pray with me? And if that's you, if you want to experience the resurrection, transformation power, it changes everything. If you want to place your faith in Jesus, say these words or something like these words with me. Heavenly Father, thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. I believe and I receive. Make me a new creation today. Thank you, God, for making a way and bringing me something that I long for deep down inside through Jesus. It's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Amen. 
Hey, that's incredible news if you prayed that prayer or, or prayed something like that with me. It means that you are now in Christ Jesus. It means you've named Jesus as the leader of your life and the forgiver of your sins. And you, like Peter, have chosen to run toward the tomb, to understand the resurrection and to place your faith in Jesus. And here's what I wanna say. I wanna say I am so excited if you made that decision today. Hey, we wanna help you as a church. We wanna come alongside of you and, and, and like engage with you and connect with you and talk to you about what this means. So we've created an opportunity for you to begin dialoguing and, and let us know that you made that decision. If you would just text Live to the number that you see on the screen, we have folks who are standing by ready to engage with you and talk with you and help you take next steps towards really fully experiencing the transformation that only the resurrection can bring. Hey, I'm so excited that you made that choice. I can't wait to see you continue to walk out this faith in Jesus, just like Peter did. The resurrection is good news. It changes everything for everyone by un helping us understand this idea of a living hope. It's for all of us. Let's pray together today. Heavenly Father, thank you for raising Jesus from the dead. Thank you for putting your incredible power and your incredible love on display in that moment for all of us to see. God, this idea of a new creation is so exciting. It's what we need. We don't wanna be stuck in our past. We don't wanna have an uncertain future. We don't wanna keep feeling like life isn't, wor it isn't worth living, God. We wanna be the opposite. So God, through your presence, would you change us and transform us? Would you help us to be just like Peter was, changed by the power of your resurrection from dead to living, just like Jesus. God, thanks for making a way where there was no way. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we say thank you. Amen. Amen. We are so glad that you chose to join with us today. And our prayer for you is that you believe what Dave said, that the resurrection changes everything for everyone and that that reality brings hope alive in your life. And for all of us, our next steps into that hope might look def different, but we would love to take those steps with you. We have seven locations that you can join us in Pittsburgh, and we would love to help you take next steps to get involved in one of those locations. Or keep watching with us online. Join us every week we're here, and we would love to hear from you and, and help you grow in your faith. Again, you can text NWALIVE to the number you see on the screen, and we would love to reach out to you and get you connected. Hope you have a great Easter, everyone. See you soon.